Okay, so why don't we uh, just take some time to uh, look at um, efficiency one, two, and three, and maybe you can just share what is it that um, you know something that you have learned, something that you have understood, something that has been highlighted. You know, I'm sure you read this before, but uh, for you personally, you know, something that is. Uh, that you felt is highlighted, something that you learned. Um, yeah, you can just put it on the chat. You know, something that um, that you saw afresh, right? As we were studying, as we were going through. Um, yeah, just go ahead, and uh, you could share chapter one, chapter two, chapter. Three. Um, see, in chapter one, one of the things that we need to be clear about is, uh, you know, this whole issue or whole topic of predestination. Okay, so, <clears throat> so, so what is your understanding of predestination? Right. Um, anyone? We see this, you know, mentioned in chapter uh, in chapter one and verse five. Right? Being predestined, having predestined us to adoption. Then again, in verse 11, we see the same thing. You know, that word again coming, that we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, and uh, and so on. So, so what is this predestination? Well, that is what we see right, right there, chapter 1. So what do you think? Now that we are in chapter four, uh, I think we need to be clear about you know this these things, right? So, anyone, um, Dave, Thomas, can anyone? Just go ahead and share. What is this predestination? God already. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. God already cho chose us before the foundation of the earth in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. So we have to be saved and to walk in His holiness. Okay. So, so that's already chosen, pre predestined thing. Mm -hmm. So the question is now: Does that mean that God has? Uh, you know, already predestined. Okay, some people will be saved, some people will not be saved. Uh, God gave the choice to us. He chosen the true. The gospel is preached, but choice is ours whether to accept the truth or not. Uh, many people mm -hmm. didn't understood the thing and not accepted, but some people understood and accepted. That is the difference, I believe, Pastor. Yeah, so what did he predestine? You know, when we say, okay, he predestined that according to the foundation, I mean, even before the foundation of the world, that we will be saved. Now, so what did he predestine? And, okay, I, I'm reading what uh, Dave, has, Dave is sharing. Uh, let's put it on the chat. He's saying, God, God doesn't predetermine who is saved or not. Okay, so that's something that, uh, you know, Thomas, what you also shared, God does not predetermine in the sense he's given us free choice. Okay, but it's it's just that God already knows our choices. Yes, that is true. He Because he's omniscient, uh, he knows our choices. You know, this is what this person, you know, the uh, uh, this is the choice that, you know, this person will make. You know, he knows that already. Right, so that is something that he knows, and based on our choice, so this is what he has predestined us. You know, when we look at it, what is what did we, what did he predestine us to be? In verse five, he predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to Himself, according to the good pleasure of His will. So, well, he knows that we are going to make this choice. So, 
let's say, for example, he's saying, okay, Thomas is going to make this choice. Um, he knows that already. But God is not involved in making the choice for Thomas. But Thomas is making the choice himself. Right. So what is God predestining? He's, he's deciding, okay, when Thomas makes this choice, then he will be adopted into the family as my son. Right. So that is something that is he pre, that is he that that is something that he's predestining. You know, he, he's pre-planning, and um, it, it is in his foreknowledge he knows that okay, Thomas will make this choice. But when Thomas makes that choice, this is what this is who he will be. Now that he is predestined. We look at verse eleven. We have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things according to the counsel of His will. So, uh, He, according to His purpose, according to the counsel or the wisdom or the good advice of His will, of His intention, He is predestined something. What is He predestined? He is predestined the that Thomas, when he makes the choice, uh, when he becomes the you know, you know, he is predestined that he'll be a family of God. He has also made that predestined. Uh, what he is predestined, predestined is that that he's going to obtain an inheritance. He's going to receive an inheritance, and all that he has, uh, because he's an heir of God, because he's in the family of God. He's going to receive this inheritance. Now that is something that is predestined. Okay, so so we need to be, we need to be, you know. Uh, uh, clear on that. Okay, it is not that God is predestined some to be um, chosen, well, some are rejected. Well, it, that is not the case. He, it's just that in His foreknowledge, He knows the choices of people, and in His foreknowledge, He has also decided, pre-decided. Right? What has He pre-decided? That when this person X, Y, Z makes a choice, this will be the outcome of that choice. You know, they're going to, the, the inheritance they're going to receive, they're going to be part of the family and every other good thing um, that he has planned for us. Okay? So that is that is something that we need to see. Okay. Chapter one, again, you know, a powerful prayer there that we can apply personally in our own lives. Okay. Chapter two, position. Our position in Christ. What has happened to us because of our faith in Christ? You know that you've made a life. He has made a life. You've become, uh, you know, you've become a believer. You become a son and daughter of God. Um, and also, uh, it talks about how you have uh, been made alive, spiritually quickened, right? made alive quickened in the spirit so that you you can relate to God and and it talks about how you were raised up how we are seated no that's a powerful truth again right that in the spirit we are actually seated within now you might be wherever you are whichever country you are you are you know in right now whichever city you are in right now but in the spirit though physically we might be you know, in such and such a place, confined to time and, you know, uh, distance and all that. But in the spirit, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places, right? Um, that is what we see. Verse 6, chapter 2, verse 6, raised us up, made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus because, because we are one spirit with him. Now, that's another powerful truth. Right, so we see that, and then how, as Gentiles, as non-Jewish people, you know, we have been brought near whatever was separating us from the people of covenant. You know, that was broken, and He has made both the people of the covenant and people who were, you know, not of the covenant. He has made both one in His body, that is a new creation. Right, both become new creation by through their faith in Christ, and this is a grace of God. Okay, um, so that no one can boast, and and he talks about he gives a different you know different pictures you know the the building that you are a holy temple and you are being built as a dwelling place in the spirit and so on. So there's so much about the identity about who we have become. You know, 
in, in Ephesians and particularly in chapter 2. Right? And chapter 3, he's talking about himself and how revelation was given to him for the sake of others, for the sake of the Christ, for the sake of the church, sorry. And, uh, and we see that this revelation is something that is, uh, you know, he, he was uh, given uh, to be, to steward it to others. And, and so also for us, that revelation, the grace of God, which is given to us, is to steward to others. Okay, and, and then in chapter three, we see that he prays again, and he prays um, that you'll be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So five things he prays for, and uh, and then uh, chapter three ends by saying that you know he's able. He talks about the, the glory of God, talks about uh, the very nature of God and what he can do. He says, you know, to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think right? according to the power that works in us to him be glory in the church now again it's not only the ability of god but it's also the the willingness and the intention of god that he wants to do um you know ab above all that we ask or think he is, wants to do um, exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think Okay. okay, so um, chapter 4, verse 1, we saw the uh, first few verses. Um, let's, uh, let's move to the other uh, verse also. Okay, let's uh, share the notes. Okay, so what is he saying? Um, chapter 4, saying this is what, you know, I'm a prisoner and I'm, and I'm beseeching you to walk worthy. Uh, and he's explaining, like, what is this? You know, how can I walk worthy? of the call um, with which I was called, you know, with loneliness, gentleness, long suffering, uh, bearing with one another in love and so on. Right. Verse chap uh, sorry, verse two, um, verse three, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So, which means you, I'm working, I'm working at preserving the unity of the spirit that is given for the believer. Like preserving that unity, you know, you work at it, you endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. Now, this, the peace of God, uh, which is going to be the bond, which is going to be the, you know, the the thing that causes us us to um, stay together, right? To keep the uh, unity. Um, so, so. You know, so he's going to do everything. So he's saying, you know, this is what you need to do as believers, that you do everything, that you put in effort to 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 be united and in to be, you know, to promote peace, not strife, not disunity, but uh, you keep the unity which the Holy Spirit brings. Right? It's not a fleshly effort, but the Holy Spirit brings in that unity. Okay. Okay, let's look at verse 4. Verse 4. There is one body and one spirit okay so he's talking about some things that as believers as the church you know this is all you have in common there's no difference right um so in other words he's just giving the reasons for why you should endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace because you're you're not very different well you know, in the sense we are, you, you, we are unique. We are unique in our calling, gifting, and all that. But here are the common things that we have. Here are things that we have in common uh, between us, right? What is it that uh, he talks about? Uh, verse four. I'm sorry, verse four. You know, uh, he lists all these things, right? That we have one body. We all belong to the same spiritual body of Christ. We have one spirit. We have the same Holy Spirit. One hope of our calling, you know, we have the same hope in Christ. One Lord, we serve the same Lord, we worship the Lord. One Lord, one faith, right? we have the same common faith. One baptism, right? we have been baptized into Christ. And uh, he's talking about, uh, you know, we, there, there is only one baptism. When, when you talk, actually, when you look at it, there are... Uh, the, the word baptism is to immerse completely. And, and the Bible talks about three instances, right? One is um, when you're baptized in water, when you're baptized with the Holy Spirit, and we are baptized in the body of Christ. Okay, baptized in water, of course, Matthew 28, the Great Commission, right? 
the the, the Lord talks about that. Um, and of course, uh, Holy Spirit baptism, we see in Matthew 3, Acts chapter 1, uh, you know, wait in Jerusalem till you are endured with, you know, power on high, be filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Spirit. Then 1 Corinthians 12 talks about the fact that when we become believers, we are baptized into the body of Christ. So we know that there are, you know, these three instances, but here he's talking about, you know, one baptism where, um, you know, when we're talking about baptizing in water, there is only one, like one faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. So, well, this is it. You have all these things. This is common to all of us as believers and therefore endeavor. You know, endeavor to walk in or endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And also, um, you know, uh, what he's talking about in verse two, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, you know, bear with one another in love and then endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Okay. So he's uh, now here in verse seven, he talks about, okay, each of us were given a measure of Christ's gift. Okay, let's read from verse seven till the end of uh, till you know right through to verse sixteen. Okay, um, verse seven. But to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now, this he ascended. What does it mean? But that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heaven, that is, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we all come to the knowledge of the faith, sorry, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Okay, so he's talking about the believers. He's saying, okay, these is all. These are all the things that you have in common. You know, one Lord and one faith and one baptism, one Father, one God, who is above all and through all and in you all. You know, that's a beautiful thing. That you know, He's the one who indwells you, and it's not like a different person is indwelling the other believer. He's, you know, he might look different, he might act different, um, but it's the same indwelling. Holy Spirit, same God. Now, he's saying, but to each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay. Now, individually, they were, there, there are some things that are given differently. Right? So he says, to each one, um, according each of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Okay. Now we we looked at that the grace of God, right? We uh, I think uh, in chapter two when we looked at that we saw uh, what does grace mean? What does grace encompass, right? Um, so so this was given to us and for our individual gifting, accord, uh, according to the measure of Christ, gift grace was given. Okay, so something. We have, we have all received. Okay. He also talks about, um, okay, let's let's look at that. You know, what is the measure of Christ's gift? You know, 
So which means that uh, each of us, you know, may be given a different measure of a Christ gift. Okay, so the, Christ, the, the gift here, um, talking about the gift of uh, the gift of God, the gift of the Holy Spirit, and uh, talking about um, you know different measures of the gift. Okay. So measure meaning that it different uh, in in different intensity or in different uh, um, levels of maturity. Okay, so we have been given uh, a measure. Okay, so as believers, we've been given a measure. Now, what we do with it, with that measure of Christ's gift, determines. You know whether we grow in it, whether we uh, whether the gift be, becomes effective, um, whether we are faithful in stewarding that grace, right, or we neglect it and and then it is unused and we are not really effective in it, right? So, so the thing is this that we are called to be uh, faithful. Right. You know, if you if you uh, remember, if you recall in in First Timothy, Second Timothy, Paul is actually writing to Timothy and asking him to use the gift. Right. So in let's say in First Timothy, um, he, he says, um, 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 Yeah, First uh, Timothy chapter four and verse fourteen. Right, do not neglect the gift which is in you, that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy, by the laying on of hands of the eldership. Right, uh, don't do not neglect First Timothy chapter four verse fourteen. Uh, Second Timothy chapter one verse six. Therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So he's saying, you know, it's up to us not to neglect it. It's up to us to stir up the gift and walk in it. And Paul is actually reminding Timothy to do that. You know, don't give in to fear because God has not given us a spirit of fear. So let fear not stop you. Let fear not stop you from using that gift. So we all grow. We can all grow in the grace, in the gift, in the functioning, in in the body of Christ, in the kingdom of God. Um, so it's up to us. But we have been given a measure, right? Now the thing is, um, according to the anointing that we have been given, according to our faithfulness in stewarding it, according to our you know uh, our use in glorifying God we grow in it right okay so then he begins to uh, address something something else he says you know um, Ephesians 4 and 8 onwards say therefore he says when he ascended on high so Paul is saying that Lord Jesus he ascended he went to heaven uh, after dying on the cross, he rose again. He went to heaven, and and uh, and he gave gifts to men. Right here, he's talking about descending, about going into Hades. He says, "You know, who's the one who ascended, but is also the one who descended." So, hell in Greek is Hades, uh, and. Uh, I think we've looked at it uh, again, but let's you know let's just review this. Um, so it's a place in the Old Testament. We see that uh, something. Uh, we see another term, which is Abraham's bosom, which was a place for or paradise. There's a place for the Old Testament saints, like when people died, um, their spirit went to this place, right? And uh, it is equivalent. So this Hades is equivalent of that. So it talks about the place when Jesus died. He he went to this place and he talks about it. He says, today you will be with me in paradise when he uh, talks to the thief on the cross who was next to him. So he goes there and uh, 
he did something there right so uh, the uh, which he emptied right? emptied the the emptied hell and he also talks about uh, when we when we go on uh, paul talks about in in corinthians he talks about how he was caught up into third heaven into paradise so now we know that okay this the lord jesus he did something he went to uh, he went down he descended into hell he did something there he emptied the place and he is now in heaven right he ascended into heaven and he gave gifts to men now okay we let's look into this a little later we will go into it a little later but the fact is that he gave gifts after he descended and then after he ascended uh he gave gifts to men by the work of his spirit right he gave gifts unto men men meaning mankind right it's not just men as in gender but he gave gifts to mankind okay so paul is going to explain about what were these gifts that were given to mankind or anthropos right so these gifts that are that we are going to look at are you know christ gives to mankind okay so it's irrespective of whether one is um you know male or female right so that is the thing we need to understand that when and because when uh, you know he, when he, when we look at the term there word there okay give gifts to men and then uh, we can wrongly conclude that it is only for men or only for the male no he actually the gifts that he is given are for mankind right male and female okay so let's look at that so uh ephesians 4 verse 11 says that he himself gave some to be apostles so he is listing i mean listing there five gifts right five or what we call as fivefold ministry gifts ministry functions ministry offices uh, several terms we use to describe this so uh, apostle prophet uh, evangelist pastor and teacher so five he mentions here and he says that he gave some to be apostles some to be now you know, when you look at this this is different from verse 7 where he says but to each of us grace was given each of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift so it's talking about the gifts of the spirit there in verse 7 where which everyone has access to like everyone has access to this gifts of the spirit uh, to each of us right even in 1 Corinthians 12 we see the same usage where where um, um let me just quickly read that uh, 1 Corinthians 12 you know manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all that is 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7 the manifestation of the spirit is given to each one for the profit of all so here verse 7 talks about how to each one of us uh, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift okay but in verse 11 we see that he himself gave some to be apostles some prophets some evangelists and so on right uh, and some pastors and teachers which means that well as much as god has given uh, each one the gifts of the spirit he calls some into what is called as the fivefold ministry gift right um, and it is it is not something that i i decide or you and i get to decide but then he decides and he calls and he gives some to be apostles some to be prophets and so on okay so um so which means that um well he's calling some first of all you know we know that it's it's not just for men it's for men and women so he's calling some to be this right uh in into the apostolic into the prophetic as a prophet as an evangelist okay now we also know you know what is the difference between ministry gift and ministry functioning well we we see that all of us can prophesy because each one has been given the measure of Christ's gift um grace is given according to the measure of Christ's gift so each of us you know 
all of us um, can you know, pioneer a church or do apostolic ministry, but not all of us are called to be apostles, right? Uh, all of us can prophesy, all of us can evangelize, all of us can teach the word, all of us can, you know, nurture someone and, you know, uh, encourage someone um, uh, in Christ and, and all that, the pastoral work. But there are some who are called to be pastors. So we know the difference between ministry gifts and ministry function, right? Okay. So, um, so what is what is the purpose? Um, he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. The purpose is mentioned in verse twelve. Okay, again, what is the purpose? For the equipping of the saints, you know, for the equipping of the saints, for the uh, training and the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Okay, so that is the purpose. Uh, another word, another translation. The older translation says perfecting of the saints. So the word used there in Greek means equipping, it means furnishing, it means complete, complete furnishing. Okay, now whatever is required, you provide the tools, provide the furniture, uh, you know, uh, or, or whatever is required is, is brought in, right? So that's the kind of equipping. And so it is for the equipping of the saints. Now the saints, again, believers, the consecrated ones, these are the, the separated ones, they are the saints. So why is this equipping of the saints? What does this equipping of the saints do? Or uh, what is it for? For the work of ministry, to go and serve. Okay, so the, uh, the apostle equips the saints in the apostolic, the prophet, equips the saints in the prophetic the evangelist equips the saints in the in evangelism and so on right the teacher and the pastor equipping the saints in the function that they do so that the saints the believers of the church can do the work of ministry can effectively do the work of ministry. So there, you know, it's a complete equipping, complete furnishing um, that is brought in to the life of the believer. Right. So we see that we need the fivefold ministry. And this is what the fivefold ministry uh, brings in to the body of Christ, where there is equipping of the believer for the work of ministry. So you see that, you know, several things we understand that okay, um, church exists for this. Like one of the things that happen in the church, right, the, or, or we would say the main thing that happens in the church is the equipping of the believer. You know, if the church does not equip the believer, if the, if in the body of Christ, then you know we don't have this kind of equipping into the apostolic, into the prophetic, into the thing. Then where is the work of ministry, or where is the effective work of ministry, right? For the work of ministry, the saints are equipped and equipped by the fivefold and the fivefold given by Christ. He calls, he invites, and he appoints uh, some to be this, some to be this, some to be the other in the body of Christ. Okay, So it's all in the plan of God. Right? So what is this? Equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, for the building up of the body of Christ. Right? So, so the body of Christ, made of believers, they are built up. They are spiritually edified. There is strength in their spiritual life. Okay, They are, they are edified. There is spiritual, constructive spiritual progress in their lives. Right. So that happens. Also, the body is edified because you know the evangelists, you know, would equip the uh, equip the people to go reach out and uh, share the gospel, and, and more are, you know, more people are immersed in the body of Christ, baptized in the body of Christ. You know, as they accept Christ, they are baptized in the body of Christ, and the, so the local church is growing 
in number. And as they grow in number, they also grow in strength and they are also equipped by the fivefold ministry in the church. So both in terms of you know, numbers, increasing in numbers, also, also in terms of increasing in strength and, uh, you know, edification, um, you know, there's edification happening, both, both in, in terms of strength, in terms of character, in terms of, you know, gifting and, and all that strength, you know, both in increase in numbers and increase in uh, strength. So edification happens in both these ways. So this is the purpose, this is the plan of God, that for the edification of the body of Christ, there is the equipping of the believer for the work of ministry. Now, the work of ministry, again, you know, results in edification. The equipping of the saints results in edification of the body of Christ, right? And the equipping of the saints is done by the fivefold, appointed by Christ. So we see that plan of God unfolding, right? Verse 14 talks about another, uh, sorry, verse 13, till we all come. Okay, so when should, when should this stop? Or what is the time frame for this? You know, can we can we do it for a few years and stop, or a few years after the church is established? Can we? No, it says till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Okay, that till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. So, which means that it continues on. It continues on till there is, you know, everyone from the young, the old, come to the knowledge of the Son of God, right? When we look at it, we say, okay, is it even possible? You know, is it even possible? First of all, you know, talking about unity in the faith, oh man, people, you know, believe so much, so differently, and so, so many things, so many differences. Uh, is it even possible? Well, the fact that God has mandated this, or He has, you know, He has placed this, He has instructed. Uh, he wants this to happen, which is when He wants something, even he, it is God's will. Well, it is, it is possible. Right? With God, it is possible to the come, uh, so to to arrive at the unity of the faith, you know, to reach the place of fullness of the knowledge of Christ. Okay, so. Um, the, the second part of that talks about to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Okay, so he's talking about uh, maturity, right? A per perfect man, mature man, fully grown, okay? Mature to be like Christ, maturing to Christ-likeness, right? So it's God's will that this happens and the believer comes to maturity in Christ. So you see, you know, as maybe as pastors, maybe as church leaders, you know, this is something that we need to you know, keep in mind as we minister, uh, as we, you know, share the word, as we uh, maybe, you know, even as we lead in worship or, you know, as we teach and preach um, so that, you know, we are we are not there to just deliver a message to inspire people. You know, this is the end product, right? This is the flow. This is the um, this is the process, and this is what God has in mind for the church. This is what He wants for the church, right? Christ likeness, that everyone becomes mature in Christ. Okay, so um, so yeah, so thirteen. Second part of the verse thirteen: to a perfect man, to a measure, to the to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now it's a, it's a big thing, you know. It's a, it's a, to the fullness of Christ. So he's the model, he's the blueprint, right? So that is what we are pursuing, and that is what we are going after. Even as as ministers, as we teach and preach, as we ourselves are growing into. Christ likeness. Now that is the, you know, Christ is the blueprint to the full measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And so also the blueprint for every believer, right? Fullness of Christ, Christ likeness. Verse 14, 
talks about you know why Christ likeness. One of the aspects is that we should no longer be children. Okay, now when it comes to children, yes, we are called to have childlike faith, right? Faith like a child, childlike faith. But the Bible also warns us not to be childish, not to be immature, right? So saying here. Verse 14, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro. Okay? That is, one day it's yes, another day it's no, one day it's yes, another day it's maybe, one day I believe this, the other day you know, I reject this. No, that we should no longer be children tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Right. So with every wind of doctrine, you know, whatever, um, you know, you're, if you're being swayed by a certain doctrine and then swayed back to something else by another new thing that is being taught uh, or being preached and, and, and swaying to something else. Right. So we should no longer be children. Now, that is possible only when there is the equipping of the believer, equipping of the believer in the word, uh, you know, training of the believer in the in the ways of the spirit, in the works of the spirit, right, in the gifts of the spirit and everything. So only when there is the equipping, will there be a grounding, right? will there be an establishing in the lives of the believers. So it helps in Christ-likeness, like coming to be like Christ, and to be like Christ is also, you know, not only character, but also in knowledge, in understanding, and in power as well. Right? So, no longer children. Coming to a place of maturity, Christ-likeness, no longer tossed to and fro. And it starts with the equipping of the same. It starts with the, with the fivefold ministry, the believers taking their place, who are called by God, right? And as they minister, as they are faithful in their ministry, then we see the effect, the outworking, the outcome of all this in the in the church, right? So, um, verse uh, fourteen says, you know, no longer children, no longer tossed to and fro, carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. So. So this is what is happening, you know. Uh, even now, it was the same over there uh, during that time that that men were not sincere. That uh, you know they were peddling the gospel, right? They they were not uh, sincere in their efforts. They were actually they were cunning. They were manipulating. They were craftiness and deceitful plotting, which means that they they, they wanted. They were doing ministry for purposes which were not sincere, which were not God honoring, right? Which was so that they themselves might be benefited. And they were doing it for their own gain. Okay, so it was not sincere. It was not the truth, because there was adulteration in what they were preaching, with what they were ministering. Okay. So well, that was what was happening. So with every wind of doctrine. So when this happens, then if the believer is not built up, is not mature, is not equipped, then the believer is going to be like a child tossed between this and that and the other. The believer is not going to be discerning because the believer is not mature enough to discern, is not equipped to discern, right? is not built up to be strong, so therefore it's going to fall. Okay, so so this is it. So the importance of equipping the saints, right? So the believer does not, or the saints are not children tossing to and fro, tossed to and fro. Um, okay, verse fifteen. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into Him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. 
okay uh, so speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him okay so here is the thing speak the truth well sometimes truth hurts right sometimes truth it, it's so direct it hurts but speak it in love right? so when we speak the truth in love then what happens is that as we speak the truth in love that we may grow up in all things in all aspects that let there be growth in all things unto him right into him who is the head christ grow up in all things speaking the truth in love and then from whom the whole body that is from whom from christ the whole body joined and knit together by by what every joint supplies right according to the effective working by which every part does its share okay so so the thing is this that um, every joint supplies something every member every part does its share so whether it's preserving unity whether it's promoting peace whether it's um, you know uh, honoring one another loving one another whether it's uh, serving one another you know uh, with the gifts right uh, where, so whatever it is right um when we do this then there is edification it there is growth in the body right effective working it causes it uh, according to the effective working but by which every part does its share causes growth of the body so the body is being edified it begins to grow um for the edifying of itself in love okay so so we see that uh, okay every believer has a role to play every believer is a saint in the body of christ every believer uh, you know is called to do the work of men so so many things that we can draw out from this passage from this chapter that every believer is called to do the work of ministry everybody was called to be equipped in the body of christ everybody was called for maturity and not remain uh, childish right and everybody was it's it's the role of the believer it's the responsibility of the believer so as ministers you know as um, you know maybe pastors we need to instill that instill that in the body okay that the body is uh, the body needs to grow the church needs to grow and so even our uh, you know perspective of you know people just coming and attending and going you know that changes right we don't want to like have church just for numerical purposes or you know numerical growth or oh, wow it's a great congregation 500 600 1000 1000 10000 um which is which is wonderful right but at the same time to see that well this is the end result the edifying of itself growing of the body edifying its itself and according to the effective working by which every part does its share right to each one is given a measure of christ gift according to the effective working by which each Uh, part does its share so everyone has a has something to do in the body of christ everyone has been given something to do in the body of christ and everyone has been equipped by um the, uh, the fivefold to do something to serve uh, uh serve to minister to be equipped for ministry right so we understand that this is what the church is about this is what ministry is about and uh, and this revelation right is from the holy spirit from god um uh, made known to the body of christ uh by the apostles and the prophets and so on right so this is this was not previously known uh in previous dispensation but in the current dispensation it's made known to the body of christ okay so um we're done with um up to verse 16 so next class we will continue with uh, from 17 onwards
okay um, just a quick uh, update about uh, our irp class next that is tomorrow we will not have we will not be meeting okay i'll put it in the stream as well uh, just put it on the on, on your whatsapp group that we will not be meeting for our irp class tomorrow um just continue with the work continue with the research work we will meet the following uh, wednesday instead right okay okay thank you have a nice day god bless thank you sir thank you right. see you bye bye